in all of the things, God is working for the good of those who love him. And here's what that means for you. It means the next time that something frustrating or backwards or unplanned happens, instead of panicking, instead of thinking, this is going to ruin everything. Instead, if you're a Christian, you can say this. I wonder how God's going to use this one. You probably know this if you played sports or if you love sports, that sometimes there is a gap between potential and performance, right? Sometimes you're the higher seed, you're the better team. Sometimes on paper, you're more talented, you're bigger, you're stronger, you're faster, you're better. But that doesn't necessarily mean in every moment that you show it. Sometimes your head isn't in the game. Sometimes you play down to your opponents. Sometimes it's just not your day. Sometimes there's this gap between potential and what actually happens. And maybe it's just me thinking about me. And maybe it's just me thinking about how many people claim to follow Jesus in America and what the reputation of the people of Jesus is in America. But I, th I think that that, falling short of potential, happens way, way too often in my life and in yours. Right? We have the potential to love, to forgive, to not worry, to trust in God, to not fear cancer, to, to sacrifice anything, to stand out in the crowd. The, the potential is there, but man, that's, that's so often not what I see in me. Like sometimes even we Christian people forget our joy so fast, don't we? Like a tiny bit of bad news, a little bit of criticism, a, a Teenager rolls her eyes. A boss makes a demand. And it's like all of this stuff we just sang about, psh, it's like totally out of our minds in a second. And we're just so focused on the bad thing and the complicated thing and the painful thing that the joy of the Lord, which we could live with every single day, is just gone. And sometimes, even, even though we have the Holy Spirit in our heart, even though no sin has to be committed, sometimes we just act so helpless. Oh, well, there I did it again. I guess I'm just an impatient person. A anxious is what I'm always going to be. It was like roll over like we're victims instead of people literally who have God living in their hearts. And sometimes we forget how the story ends. Something complicated happens with work. Um, there's an election. There's some breaking story. And we, we panic as if God who controls all things is not going to work out all things for our good. We lose our optimism and hope and curiosity and we give in to panic and fear and grumbling and worry. We don't have to, but so often it happens. Like the, the church of Jesus Christ is the number one seed in the tournament, yet sometimes in the first quarter and into the second, we don't, we don't play up to it. So you tell me, if it's halftime, or if it's the middle of the game and the coach kind of sees a team with tremendous talent and potential falling short in their performance, what does, what does he do? What does she do? Well, there's actually a simple answer. You call a timeout. You get the talented people together. The cheerleaders come out. They get the crowd hyped and jacked. And then some leaders on the team, maybe the captains, they step forward like, all right, this is the moment we're going to turn this around. There's like a cheer that somehow restores and changes things. And so if you're anything like me and you have the potential to be a great Christian, but your performance has fallen short, here's what we're going to do today. We're going to call time out. I'm going to be both your coach and lead cheerleader. Thankfully, I'm dressed for the occasion. <laughs> And we here, we're not just going to be the players, but we're going to be the crowd. And what I hope happens before you walk out those doors, before this live stream ends or this program ends, I hope what happens to you is that no matter what the performance was over the past few days or seasons of life, you live and you leave with such incredible joy that God calls you up to a higher standard, to the potential that is yours in the name of Jesus Christ.
So before you leave today, I'm going to teach you the church cheer. Okay? You might want to start stretching now. There, there's a 12% chance it's going to get rowdy in here before you get your next cup of coffee. All right? So stretch out if you need to, if you're a little bit older like me. Because today as we jump back into the book of Esther, we are going to learn a cheer that the church of Jesus needs to hear. It has three parts. And before you leave, I hope you know them in your heart and live them in your life. Starting in Esther chapter 8, verse 8, Xerxes said this. Now write another decree in the king's name in behalf of the Jews as seems best to you and seal it with the king's signet ring. For no document written in the king's name and sealed with his ring can be revoked. The king's edict granted the Jews in every city the right to assemble and protect themselves, to destroy, kill, and annihilate the armed men of any nationality or province who might attack them and their women and children, and to plunder the property of their enemies. The couriers, riding the royal horses, went out, spurred on by the king's command, and the edict was issued in the citadel of Susa. When Mordecai left the king's presence, he was wearing royal garments of blue and white, a large crown of gold, and a purple robe of fine linen. And the city of Susa held a joyous celebration. For the Jews, it was a time of happiness and joy, gladness and honor. In every province and in every city to which the edict of the king came, there was joy and gladness among the Jews with feasting and celebrating. As the royal couriers bring this new law throughout the 127 provinces of the Persian Empire, the message that the Jews can defend themselves is coming from the king. And it was written by his right-hand man, Mordecai, who just so happened to be a Jew. And as it says here, Mordecai was now wearing royal garments of blue and white. There was a crown on his head and a purple robe of fine linen on his back. The, the implication is, okay, you can still attack your Jewish neighbor, but if you do, not only will they fight back, but the government is on their side. And now the king is on the side of the Jews and his prime minister is on the side of the Jews. So what are you going to do for the sake of attacking your Jewish neighbor? The tables have turned, which explains the joy, doesn't it? <laughs> Even if you don't know much about the Bible, you, you couldn't miss that. I counted 10 separate times. It says the city held a joyous celebration. It was a time of happiness and joy, gladness and in honor, there was joy and gladness among the Jews with feasting and <laughs> celebrating. And all of that was in two and a half verses. When you think you're going to die and the king gives you new life, there's only one rational response. Joy. So grab a pen and write this down. It's the first part of our church's cheer. The church of Jesus Christ begins with this word, Joy. Because that story should sound familiar to you, Christians, shouldn't it? Tell me if this isn't your spiritual story. I thought I was going to die, and then the king gave me life. Right? I was physically still alive, but a day was coming when I could not defend myself. We call that death. And I was outnumbered, and there was no way for me to change the situation until the king issued a decree and the tables got turned on my eternity. That sound familiar to you, Christians? <laughs> it's like, those of us who know the state of our own souls think, I should be dead. I was born in sin, and as soon as I could prove it, I did it. I, I threw fits, and I threw fists. My first word to my mom was, Mine! And if my brother touched my Xbox controller, I socked him in the face and thought I had the right because he started it, right? And even as we grow older, patience is not our natural instinct. You first is not how you people instinctively think. It's, it's about us, right? That, that's the definition of sin, turning in on myself, what I think, what I feel, what I want, what I prefer. And worst of all, that instinct made us forget about the Almighty God. 
You know, sometimes our sins aren't like murder and armed robbery. Sometimes they're forgetfulness. Like God gives me breakfast and then lunch and then dinner and I, f- I forget him. God gives me safety and security. He gives me friends, family, music. He gives me life and I just, it, it doesn't dawn on me that I don't deserve it. That, and you lump all of that together and you think, I should be dead. God should have a date on his calendar, my, my death date, where he purges me from his presence now and forever. But, <laughs> ready for the transition? But, but then my King Jesus issued a decree. Just when we thought we were spiritually dead and gone, our Jesus gave us life. That's what we celebrate, that about 500 years after Esther lived, Jesus came. And instead of just shaking a finger of judgment at rebellious humans like us, instead he was judged for humans like us. He went to a cross and he bled and he died so that all of that sin, all of that selfishness would be wiped away. So that Christian people wouldn't have to worry about the day we take our last breath. Wouldn't have to fear the accident, the disease, the heart problems, the the cancer, the transplant. We would know that when our time comes to stand before God, he has washed us, made us whiter than snow. He's not cast us from his presence. Instead, he has had such compassion and such mercy because of the work of Jesus Christ that we don't have to fear death. And when when you get that, I was going to hell. And then I got heaven. I I had no right to be in the presence of God. And now I have every right to approach the throne of grace with confidence. When you realize that no matter what happens to you financially or physically or relationally, you have these blessings eternally, there is only one rational emotion and it is joy. Okay. Okay, life is hard but I'm a child of God. Okay, the boss might might be done with me, but I have a God who's never going to be done with me. I'm struggling with fertility. I can't have children, but, but I'm still a child of the most loving being in the universe. I open up my banking app. Those numbers are depressing, but I'm numbered among the saved, forgiven people of God, and that is the opposite of depressing. <laughs> the headlines are freaking me out because everything is uncertain, But I know one thing that's certain, that I'm loved by Jesus Christ today and he will never leave me and he will never, ever forsake me. The more you think think about that, and I'll test you this way, just imagine for a second if you didn't know Jesus. What would you do? What would you think about you? What would you think about death? All right, end of thought experiment. Now think about Jesus. (laughs) And you know who you are, loved by God. You know what's going to happen at the end of the story. You will die, take your last breath, and then see the most beautiful, powerful, glorious, thrilling thing in the whole universe. Man, think about what is ours through Jesus Christ, and the joy will start to bubble up in your heart. And, part two, I hope it encourages you to fight. Uh, Historians say that on June 25th, 474 BC, King Xerxes issued his decree. But nine months after that, the following March in our calendar, there was still the date when the purge had the potential to happen. So the king took the side of the Jewish people, and yet... It didn't mean that they could take a nap and have a party. There was still a fight that had to be fought. So let's jump over to Esther chapter 9. Let's look at what happens. It says, On the 13th day of the 12th month, the Jewish month of Adar, the edict commanded by the king was to be carried out. On this day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them. I love this line. But now the tables were turned and the Jews got the upper hand over those who hated them. The Jews assembled in their cities in all the provinces of King Xerxes to attack those determined to destroy them. No one could stand against them. 
because the people of all the other nationalities were afraid of them. And all the nobles of the provinces, satraps, the governors, and the king's administrators helped the Jews because fear of Mordecai had seized them. Mordecai was prominent in the palace. His reputation spread throughout the provinces, and he became more and more powerful. The Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them. Ah, the tables returned. Mordecai had power, he had influence, but you, you still see throughout this massive empire, 127 provinces, there was not just one or two, but literally tens of thousands of people who attacked God's chosen people. And that meant the Jews had to stand up, they had to assemble together, they had to come up with a plan, and they had to fight back. Fight. Why don't you write down that word too? There's joy in being a Christian, amen. But number two, there is also a fight. That's what cheerleaders say to the team, right? Not just go, win, but fight. Like, the team you're playing against isn't going to roll over and just let you have the layup. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to dig. You're going to have to grind. You're going to have to fight if you want a victory in this moment. And that's so true for Christian people, too. Now, we're not fighting against our fellow human. The Bible says that our fight is not against flesh and blood. Like the Jews in Esther's day, we're not picking up swords. Uh, instead, we're using our words to fight against lies and untruth. Essentially, if you had to de describe the Christian fight, I think you could say it this way that our fight is to make sure that God remains God. Right? There's a world, there are family and friends that we know and love who want to define their own truth. Like Adam and Eve, they want to decide what's right and what's wrong. They don't want to let God be God. And if we're being honest, there's something inside of our own hearts that likes that too. What I want to do, what feels good in the moment and so the fight that you and I get to fight, the good fight of the Christian faith is to just let God be God, to love him more than we love anything, to trust him more than we trust anything. That's the fight. So let me ask you a personal question right now. What, what's your fight? Like what, what specific spiritual skirmish is coming at you these days. Now, for some of you, it's just that fight against self. When things don't go your way, when it's not according to your plan, but when your spouse isn't giving you what you want, oof, you get moody, you get sullen, you get angry, you raise your voice, you make her cry. Is that your fight? Some of you are fighting to not get sucked in by the, the modern world of politics, which says if they're on the other side of the aisle, you don't have to be patient. You don't have to be gentle. You can be a mocker, a scoffer, a slanderer, an accuser. You can laugh at their defeat. You can, like, is, is that your fight? You, you love the news and you just gotten sucked in to think, I don't have to turn the other cheek. I don't have to love my enemies. Those people are the problem. Is your fright to not bail on Jesus' definition of relationships and sexuality? Right, we live in a world where there are no boundaries anymore, no rules, just don't hurt anyone, be true to yourself. That's not what Jesus said. Will you agree with him? Or will you honor your friend's feelings, your own feelings above God's feelings? But will you somehow think that 2,000 years, literally, of Christian teaching on this has been all wrong for two millennia, but now we finally, finally figured it out here in modern America. Is that, is that your fight? To believe that God is right and to believe that God is good? There are men in this room who spend more time holding a video game controller than holding their Bibles. There are women in this room who have scrolled through the profiles of the rich 
more often than they serve the needs of the poor. And there are teenagers in this room who honestly think deep in their hearts that the grown-ups need to just sit down and shut up and listen to their teenage wisdom. And uh, it, it is no joke. It is a fight. I don't know your sin or your temptation or your struggle, but I do know this. It did not show up to arm wrestle you. Like the enemies in Esther's day, it came to kill you. It came to purge the love of God from your heart. Which means it's time to fight. Listen, you don't have to go back to that. You are not some helpless human if you're a Christian. Literally, God, the Almighty God, is your Father, and He listens to the prayers of His children. The Holy Spirit, who can overcome any temptation, isn't far away trying to squeeze you into His busy schedule. He lives 24 7 in your heart. So, my question for you is if you know the fight, if you know the sin, what is your plan? Right? If I got trounced in a volleyball or a basketball game and I was playing that same team again, I would have a plan. Man, that girl murdered us last time. That, that dude dominated in the post. What are we going to change so the story is different? That, that's my question, seriously, to you. Don't, don't just come back Sunday after Sunday and say, you're sorry, I committed the same sins. Fight. Find a friend. Come up with a plan. Go to war. And put sin to death. Check out the end of Esther chapter 9. It says, Meanwhile, the remainder of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also assembled to protect themselves and get relief from their enemies. They killed 75,000 of them, but did not lay their hands on the plunder. This isn't about greed. This happened on the 13th day of the month of Adar, and on the 14th they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. Oh, it was a fight. Tens of Thousands of people rose up against them, but they assembled, they fought back, and by the grace of God, they won. So right on the last word of our cheer for today, first joy, then fight. Finally, win. Because if you're a follower of Jesus, that's the end of your story too. You win. I don't say that because I'm a prophet who knows like what's coming up in your life tomorrow, but I have... I have, believe it or not, read the last page of this book. And you know what happens? You win. And the, have you ever read Revelation before? There's like a, a dragon and crazy beasts and the, the little church looks like it's going to die and then Jesus shows up. I like to summarize Revelation with these words. It's bad. It gets worse. But don't worry. Jesus wins. <laughs> And that's what I want to say to you too, church. Um, life might be bad right now, and it might get worse. I don't know, but I do know this, that in the end, Jesus wins. I know he shows up, and it doesn't matter who's the president, who runs the government, it doesn't matter how much money you have in your bank account, how many friendships you have, how many followers on social media. Once Jesus shows up, you win. In all of the things, God is working for the good of those who love him. And here's what that means for you. It means the next time that something frustrating or backwards or unplanned happens, instead of panicking, instead of thinking, this is going to ruin everything, instead of if you're a Christian, you can say this. I wonder how God's going to use this one. It, it seems like everything is tanking right now. The world's crazy. My family's crazy. <laughs> Sometimes there's no justice in the streets. Instead of thinking that that's going to be the end of the story, you can jump to the last page and say, but wait, J Jesus wins. So I wonder how he's going to get there. I wonder how he's going to flip this struggle with anxiety. I wonder how he's going to use the death of my father. I wonder how he's going to use these mistakes that I've made, the sin that was committed against me. I'm trying to keep these kids like, clothed and safe. <laughs> like I'm barely getting, I wonder how God is going to use the madness of my family. I wonder how he's going to use the next election. I don't know how, but I do know that he will. The Christian joy is rooted in this final word that in the end, Jesus shows up 
and he and his people win. So I love to put those three words together. What is the Christian faith? What is the cheer of the church? It's joy, it's fight, and it's win. We are alive because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's our joy. We fight back with intentionality against sin. We don't have to sit here and take it because we know in the end, however these battles go, Jesus is going to come back and we will be more than conquerors through him who loved us. Joy, fight, win. Joy, fight, win. I hope you enjoyed today's message. We weren't able to record a prayer like we normally do, but I'd still love to pray with you. So let's pray. Uh, Dear God, we are so thankful for the joy that we find in Jesus. If all we had was the things of this world, uh, joy would come and go, but we always have you and we have the promise of the life to come. So as the Apostle Paul encouraged us to rejoice in the Lord always, today we focus our attention on you and we find an unshakable and unmistakable joy. Uh, God, we still have to fight. Uh, Temptation is real and the devil knows that he is defeated. So today might not be an easy spiritual day, but we are so grateful uh, that you have made a promise that we are more than conquerors through Jesus who loved us. So God, give us strength to fight, give us joy in the midst of it, and give us that hope to know that at the end of the day, we win because Jesus won. We pray all these things in his beautiful name. Amen. Do you find Jesus really interesting but kind of confusing? Maybe today you sense that God is working on your heart and giving you a new excitement about the things of the Christian faith, but you're not quite sure what to do next. If so, you're exactly the kind of person that I wrote this brand new book for called The Basics. Uh, It's not AP Bible, and it's not going to answer every question you have about Christianity, but it's going to get you back to the basics of why Jesus is worth following today and for the rest of your life. If you're interested, just go to timeofgrace.org to download your free copy. People everywhere are stressed to the max. They're mentally exhausted and emotionally drained. Not to mention that so many of us carry around baggage from our past hurts and mistakes. But there is hope. Along with his word, God gives us knowledge and tools that we can utilize to cope with our mental health. A Guide to Mental and Emotional Wellness, a new book by licensed Christian marriage and family therapist, Dr. Jennifer Lundgren, pairs biblical wisdom, practical principles, and clinical insight to help you recover peace, joy, clarity, and purpose. Throughout this book, you'll find examples and reflection breaks to help you go deeper and apply what you learn to your mental health and spiritual wellness. And in turn, empower you to shine with Jesus' light, to support your neighbors, and serve your communities. A Guide to Mental and Emotional Wellness is our way of thanking you for your financial support. Request yours today by visiting timeofgrace.org or write us at P.O. Box 301, Milwaukee, Wisconsin 53201. Time of Grace doesn't end here. Visit timeofgrace.org and explore encouraging resources or sign up for our daily email and have everything delivered right to your inbox. Like our Grace Moments devotions, Grace Talks devotional videos, blog, and podcasts. Follow us on social media where you'll find a supportive Christian community. Do you need prayer? Contact us and let us know what's on your heart. Thank you so much for your support. See you next week on Time of Grace.